Who says Grand Seiko makes the best styles? So it's kind of a funny story how I ended up with an Omega Railmaster denim because it really wasn't on my radar at all. All my watch purchases up to that point had been well under $3,000 with the most expensive watch I owned at the time being my slightly over $2,000 Oris Aquas Clean Ocean, which was the most expensive watch I had ever purchased at that point by more than double. At the time, I had saved enough money for my dream watch, my grail watch, so to speak. The Tudor Black Bay 58 in blue, which I would eventually go on to buy, but I couldn't buy one then. They still weren't readily available. I discovered a jewelry store slash watch store that was also an authorized dealer closer to where I lived than any other local ADs, though technically in a different state, so I went to go check it out. But when I got there, I found out they were going out of business. And because of that, there was no Rolex waiting list to join. And I mean, they were going out of business, like they were closing within a month. So I started looking around at a lot of the other brands in the store and Omega was one of them. Surprisingly, for a store that was going out of business, the selection they had was pretty good. I mean, they didn't have any Diver 300s or Moon watches just sitting there but they did have some pretty cool gold constellations and globe masters, a plethora of different aquaterras, and a beautiful creamsicle planet ocean on the NATO strap. Sadly, this is a case of unrequited love. While I love the creamsicle, it does not love me back. Or more specifically, it doesn't love my wrist. I tried it on and it was just way too big for me, like a giant orange and white dinner plate on my little Barbie wrist. You know, not too many women spend much time wishing that they were bigger bones. But if I were, this video might be about the creamsicle. Anyway, while I was trying on different watches, I noticed that they had a 38 millimeter Railmaster, which was part of the 1957 trilogy. And I said, oh, a Railmaster. I like the one with the denim dial. It looks really cool. And the salesperson said, oh, we have one right here in the other window. It was on the denim and leather strap, so I tried it on and wouldn't you know, it fit. And it looked amazing. Now this was a $4,900 watch and I had saved up some money, but I didn't have $4,900. I felt pretty safe just admiring it. But here's the problem. They were going out of business and everything was on sale even some of the things that weren't supposed to be. So I said to the salesperson, what's the best price you can give me on this? Expecting, I don't know, like maybe five, 10% off. And he said, I'll give it to you for 30% off. So I bought it. The biggest impulse buy of my life. But can you really blame me? Just look at that dial. The Railmaster is theoretically Omega's answer to the Rolex Milgauss. And just like the Milgauss, it's one of the brand's most underrated offerings. The Railmaster was first introduced in 1957 as a tool watch for railroad employees, scientists, and electricians. Because digital watches didn't exist back then, there was a demand for a mechanical movement that could withstand intense magnetic fields. So Omega launched its first line of anti-magnetic watches with the Railmaster being among them. Unfortunately, the Railmaster was launched with its more popular brothers, the Speedmaster and the Seamaster. And I think it just got lost in the shuffle because its production was short-lived. And in 1963, it was discontinued. Since then, it's gone in and out of production, including back in 2003, when they released a reference with an Aquaterra style high polish case. However, I think the Railmaster has finally gained a foothold in the market. And in particular with the blue denim striking dial, I think this one might be here to stay. Anyway, this variation has an Aquaterra style case, but this time everything is brushed. So yeah, it's not flashy. It's understated, but that's kind of the point. This is a great looking tool watch with an incredibly rich and complex dial. 
The case is well proportioned and it's 40 millimeters. 40 is usually the max that I can get away with, but this wears a lot smaller for 40 millimeter with its curved, unobtrusive lugs, and it sits relatively flat on my wrist. Even though the NATO strap that I have it on does add some bulk and height to it, so I do wonder if I would have been better off getting it on the bracelet. Which brings me to one of my few criticisms of this watch. The NATO strap that I have it on is awesome. It's super high quality and it complements the intricate dial very well, but it's too thick for me personally and it clashes with a lot of the things in my wardrobe. Then there's the bracelet option. It's a standard Aquaterra style. It's brushed instead of high polish, but it doesn't have a micro adjust. Yes, there are half links and that does make it a little bit easier for you to find the right fit, but I just don't see how you sell a watch for over $5,000 on a bracelet that doesn't have a micro adjust. On the bright side, the watch does have a 20 millimeter lug width, so it gives you a lot of strap options. Okay, now let's move on to the dial. It's a brushed stainless steel striated woven indigo pattern that has a labyrinth of blue, gray, and this almost burnt orange color that matches the second hand and complements the leather of the strap well. The brush on the dial is so deep that when you look at it from every angle, you catch different flecks of color and it's easy to get lost in it. The dial has great proportions. The 3, 6, 9, 12 are perfectly balanced. They have similar, if not exactly the same sizing to the original reference, giving it that vintage feel, but without looking old or out of place. The dart style hour markers and the pencil style handset have a ton of loom and I think it looks really cool. Originally, I thought that the indices were painted on, but after some research, I found out that they're actually applied. Now you can see this a lot better on the other models because they have a faux patina loom. So if you look close, you can see where they carved out the indices to make the loom flush with the dial. Speaking of which, I am forever grateful that this is not another faux patina dial. Faux patina is a styling element that I'm just not a huge fan of. Once in a while it looks good and right, but most of the time I just can't stand it. On the blue denim, the loom is the same white as the hour markers and I think it looks great. On the other hand, it does make the numerals and the indices look more like they're painted on, so I suppose it's just a matter of taste. Though it's a bit of a departure from the original, I think that the railroad track minute scale was a great choice. One of my favorite things is that Omega has kept the original font for the Railmaster logo from 1957. Omega has managed to preserve some of the more subtle vintage elements without forsaking some of the more attractive elements of modernity. It's a really nice balance and I think they've put it together very nicely here. There isn't an obnoxious amount of text on the dial, which I appreciate. Just a mention of the coaxial escapement and the master chronometer certification. Now, the Railmaster blue denim is anti-magnetic up to 15,000 gauss, but so is pretty much every Omega, like even their dress watches. In this regard, that makes the Railmaster kind of redundant, maybe even pointless. If you really want a mechanical watch that is borderline amagnetic, you can pretty much buy any Omega and not be limited to just the Railmaster. Regardless, you can practically park this thing next to a Magnetar and it would probably still be accurate. So good job, Omega. As for the movement inside of the blue denim, it's the Caliber 8806, which is basically the same movement that you find in the Diver 300, but without the date. It's a certified master chronometer with a claimed accuracy of zero to plus five seconds a day. And mine runs about plus 10 seconds a week, which is just incredible. It's an automatic hand wind movement with a coaxial escapement and a rhodium plated rotor. Like I mentioned earlier, it is anti-magnetic up to 15,000 gauss, but it's also incredibly shock resistant and has a water resistance of 150 meters. 
This is the first Omega I have owned, and I have never had a more accurate mechanical movement. It's fantastic, and maybe better than what Rolex has to offer. Do they have the most intricate or decorated movements? No, but they have some of the most reliable, robust, and technically interesting movements anywhere near this price range. Now I can't show you the actual movement in the Railmaster blue denim because Omega opted to do a solid engraved case back, which is a decision that I support. It is a tool watch and I think this goes better with the overall aesthetic of the watch. Not to mention the fact that the engraved seahorse on the case back does look pretty cool as well. Now, as we all know, no watch is perfect. And with that said, there are some aspects to this watch that I don't love. Like I mentioned earlier, the strap is thick, which makes it very durable, but not necessarily wearable for someone with a wrist like mine. I would consider buying an OEM bracelet, but I don't wanna spend $700 for a bracelet that doesn't have a micro adjust. This dial is striking and attractive but this particular shade of indigo is not a neutral color. While this watch looks great with a pair of jeans, it often clashes with a lot of the other outfits that I wear. Stylistically, there's a lack of versatility here, which ends up with me wearing a lot of the other watches in my collection more than I wear this one. And that is the big problem. As much as I love wearing this watch, and as much as I love going out in the sunlight and just staring at the dial, I don't wear it that much, and I buy watches to wear, not just to have or keep. I have a friend who pretty much only wears jeans, basic t-shirts, and boots, and he could get away with wearing this watch every day. I wear it about once or twice a month. That's a lot of money to have tied up in something that sits out most days. I'm loath to sell it, but I have a hard time justifying keeping it as well. I'm not gonna make any rash decisions, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point I am no longer in possession of what's really probably the nicest and best watch I've had so far. So there you have it, an overview of my Omega Seamaster Railmaster Blue Denim. It's a great watch and it has a beautiful dial, but I wouldn't necessarily wear it with a suit and tie or a cocktail dress. But for some of you, it may just be the perfect combination of form and function. Thank you so much for watching. I had a ton of fun making this for everyone. If you are new here and you're enjoying the content, I encourage you to hit that subscribe button so you know exactly when I post my next video. But in the meantime, I picked out some other videos that I think you might enjoy.